book readings with Miss Bernard. Hello everyone and welcome to day 26 of our Black History Month series. Today's story is Sprouting Wings, the true story of James Herman Banning, the first African-American pilot to fly across the United States. Written by Louisa Jagger and Cherie Becker. Illustrated by Floyd Cooper. Let's begin. Five-year-old James Herman Banning tore across the red dirt fields of his family's farm, clutching the string of his homemade kite. He loved the way the wind carried leaves and birds and scraps of paper on its back. And now it was carrying his third kite. The first had tumbled, then crashed. The second had fluttered and fallen, breaking on the ground. But his third kite took off. James looked up at the speck of paper on its cross of sticks and watched its cloth tail flap against the deep blue of Canton, Oklahoma sky. One day, he said, I'm going to build a kite big enough to ride on. In early October 1905, James' father decided it was time to go to town. Going to town days meant crackers, peppermint sticks, and pieces of licorice. Today, though, James could tell something was different. Men and women, girls and boys were talking loudly, waving their hands, clutching their newspapers. A flying machine, he heard someone call. A flying machine? On the front page of the Oklahoman, James read that the Wright brothers flew their airplane at Kitty Hawk, North, North Carolina for 16 and a half minutes in the air. James didn't need a big kite to touch the sky. He needed a flying machine. Six years later, still no flying machines flew over the Banning homestead. But James didn't stop wondering how those mechanical birds stayed up in the air. Luckily, twice a year, Ma and Pa took Ma and Pa took them all to Guthrie, 82 miles away, to the Excelsior Library, the first black library in all of Oklahoma. Here, in a ramshackle Victorian, filled with other people's thrown away books, he found information about flying machines and flight, about lift, force, and drag, about real birdmen taking them into the sky. One newspaper headline said that Charles Walsh, a birdman, was bringing his plane to the local fair in, Tom in Thomas on November 10th, 1911. Thomas was only eight miles away. On November 10th, the fairground was packed. Walsh's pusher plane swooped low and buzzed the crowd. Then, rat-a-tat-tat, the plane landed. Walsh climbed out to whoops and hollers. Yay! All James could see was the plane. His hands itched to touch the metal bird. James dashed to the plane and climbed through the spider web of wires and cords. Then he sat in the kitchen chair nailed to the floor. He closed his eyes and flew. A boy in the plane, people shouted. But James didn't hear them. He didn't turn to see Walsh running up to the pusher. Hey, get away from there, Walsh yelled. James scrambled out of the plane and ran, but he could still smell the oil and gas, feel the controls in his hand. He was still flying. On June 28, 1914, the Great War broke out in Europe. Planes covered the fronts of newspapers and magazines, Bristol Type 22s, Fokker Eindeckers, and Sopwith Camels. At the Gem Theater, for five cents or an egg, yes, a chicken egg, <laughs> James watched newsreels with awe as fighter planes swooped through the air. When James graduated from Favor High School, he did what none of his friends or family had ever done before. He applied to college. He was one of only seven black students accepted into Iowa State that year. Though his grades were good, money was so tight he could only go for one year. Even so, he held on to his dream of becoming a bird man. When Banning was 21, he opened his own business in Ames, Iowa, Banning Auto Company. 
He fixed motorcycles and automobiles and farm equipment, all the while looking for someone who would teach him to fly. There were bird men and bird women in Iowa, designing airplanes, building airfields, and starting flight schools. But no one would teach Banning, a black man. Then, one day, a man pushed a broken motorcycle into Banning's shop. Banning noticed the military aviator wings on the man's leather jacket. His name was Lieutenant Raymond Fisher, and he was a pilot. He asked Fisher if he would teach him to fly. Lieutenant Fisher didn't care that Banning was black. He only cared that Banning wanted to fly. This time, the answer was yes. Banning met Fisher at dawn, and both men climbed into Fisher's Curtis Jenny biplane. Banning gently pushed the throttle full forward. <clears throat> the engine roared as the plane hopscotched down the runway. The Jenny's nose lifted and caught the wind under her wings. Banning could hear the roar and smell the oil and taste the wind. A year later, it was time for him to solo. But on April 12, 1926, when Banning arrived at Fisher's Field, he found a mangled metal bird. Fisher's Jenny had crashed and Fisher had died that morning, that very morning. Banning was heartbroken. He'd lost his friend and the one person helping him take to the skies. Banning still needed solo hours to earn his pilot's license, but no one would lend him an airplane. So he decided to build his own. He bought a spare engine at an auction, purchased a Jenny fuselage, and scavenged wires, cords, and automobile parts. He put the pieces together in a nearby cow pasture. With the help of five friends, Banning built his first plane. But was it even safe to fly? Banning wasn't sure. Every day he climbed into his plane, started the motor, partially opened the throttle, and slowly, slowly drove it in circles on the ground. This became the town joke, Banning and his ground plane. <laughs> then, one Saturday afternoon, Banning warmed up the motor, taxied to the end of the field, and pushed the throttle wide open. The full power of the motor propelled him down the field far faster than he expected. The field's high fence suddenly appeared in front of him. He yanked back on the stick and up he went. He was flying. I have sprouted wings, James Herman Banning shouted to the clouds. Banning received his pilot's license number 1324, but he still wanted more. He wanted to learn to barnstorm, to loop the loop to barrel roll, and to make a dead stick landing. His first loops didn't loop, and his rolls didn't roll. But Banning didn't give up. Soon he was circling the sky and rolling across the clouds. He had taught himself to barnstorm. In California, 1,719 miles away, a man named William Powell dreamed that freedom in the air would one day lead to freedom on the ground. He wanted to open a flight school for black men and women. So Powell opened the Bessie Coleman Aero Club and went looking for a black pilot. He sent a letter to the Negro Associated Press and it appeared in the California Eagle, the New York Amsterdam News, the Pittsburgh Courier, and the Chicago Defender. It also appeared in the Iowa Bystander in November, 1929. As soon as Banning read Powell's letter, he knew he was the pilot Powell needed. He began packing that very day and moved to Los Angeles. Powell hired Banning on the spot as chief pilot. In the next three years, Banning taught air-minded black men and women to fly and to perform aerobatic stunts. On September 7th, 1931, Powell and Banning put on the first all-black air show. In 1932, Banning left the Aero Club to follow a new dream. He wanted to be the first black man to fly from Los Angeles to New York. All he needed was a plane. 
His friend Arthur Dennis had a dilapidated Eagle Rock with a 14-year-old engine. It needed a lot of work. Thomas Cox Allen, a local airplane mechanic, didn't have a pilot's license, but he knew how to make engines, even old engines, roar. He also had $200. Banning and Allen didn't get along well, but they shared the hope of being the first black men to fly cross country. They fixed the Eagle Rock, replacing pistons, spark plugs, and the overhead action valve. When they were done, they had only $25 left. Banning and Allen scored a map and looked for towns and cities where they knew people, where people had skin the color of theirs. They charted a route through towns and cities where it would be safe for them to land. At every stop, family, friends, townspeople, city folk, church congregations, anyone, everyone who helped them with a meal, a place to sleep or gas money, would get to sign their names on the gold book the wings of the Eagle Rock. Gee, said Allen, we'll be just like hobos, begging our way. Fine, said Banning, that gives me an idea. We'll call ourselves the Flying Hobos. (laughs) On September 19, 1932, Banning and Allen took off from Dicer Airport in Los Angeles. They flew from Alambre to Riverside, California, from Yuma to Tuscan, Arizona. Everywhere they went, people helped however they could, providing money, meals, transportation, lodging, gas, oil, repairs, and sometimes even spare plane parts. But in Lordsburg, New Mexico, where the copper mines were empty and no one had any money, the Eagle Rock ran out of gas. Allen sold his fancy suit, his only suit, to a Mr. R.C. Hightower for $10, just enough money to get them to El Paso, Texas. Banning and Allen flew on. 19 names were written on the gold book. 19 friends flying along with them. They flew from Wink to Midland, then on to Wichita Falls, Texas. But as they flew over the Guadalupe Mountains, they ran into fog so heavy they couldn't see their wingtips. We lucked through, said Banning when they came out of the fog. They continued on to El Reno, Oklahoma, where Banning's brother Archibald lived. As they headed to Oklahoma City, 30 names were written on the gold book, 30 friends flying with them. They flew from Tulsa to Miami, Oklahoma, then to Carthage, Missouri. At a pit stop in St. Louis, the tired bird's engine gave out again. A local mechanic school rebuilt it as a class project. In Terre Haute, Indiana, they fixed a broken push rod. In Columbus, Ohio, the people of the Second Baptist Church gave them $5. Every stop brought them closer to New York, but they still had over 500 miles to go. As they approached Cambridge, Ohio, the Eagle Rock's engine sputtered, the plane dropped, the engine rattled, then died. There was a haystack on one side of them and a barn on the other. Banning flew sideways between the two, then righted the plane, pulling the stick all the way back. As the wheels hit the ground, the plane bounced like a jackrabbit. Banning had made a perfect dead stick landing. The townspeople came running. Many had never seen an airplane. None had ever seen a black man fly. The steel in our motor is so old it's crystallized. Two rocker arms went out, Banning said. With the help of the townspeople, black and white, Banning and Allen got the Eagle Rock back in the air. Banning thanked the people with a loop and a barrel roll. The flying hobos flew on with 68 names inscribed on the gold book, 68 friends flying with them. The Eagle Rock's engine died again as they landed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home to the Pittsburgh Courier. Banning had been writing about the flight for the newspaper, coast to coast via the aerial highways. The editor, Mr. Robert Lee Van, said he would pay to fix the Eagle Rock if they tossed 150,000 vote for Roosevelt campaign flyers out of the plane. 
Banning agreed. They headed to York, then to Philadelphia, then on to West Trenton, New Jersey, where they spent the night. Now, 72 names were written on the gold book. There is not one inch of space on our old Eagle Rock that is not written on, <laughs> said Banning. On October 9th, 1932, at 9.15 in the morning, Banning and Allen gassed up the Eagle Rock. They checked the engine and the oil. Allen hand propped the propeller. Banning took off. Soon they were in New York. Banning looped around Lady Liberty once to let her know they'd made it. <laughs> Banning and Allen landed in Valley Stream, New York after traveling for 21 days with the help of 24 communities. They had used 410 gallons of gas and spent $150 to fly 3,300 miles to the other side of the country. That night, they celebrated with the biggest stars in Harlem, Cab Calloway, Mrs. Bill Bojangles Robinson, and Louis Armstrong. After years of dreaming, Banning and Allen were stars too. The end. Ooh. Wow, what a remarkable story of just sheer perseverance and determination to reach his goal. Not to mention bravery and dreaming of flying at a time when airplanes were a brand new concept. Yeah, so always remember to never let any obstacle stop you from achieving your goals, just as Mr. Banning did. All right, I hope you have a wonderful, awesome, beautiful, magnificent day. Bye-bye.